Imagine a world in which humans and monsters could not only coexist, but even live together and become partners. That's reality for young Yuki. In his world, it's pretty common for succubae to attach themselves to a human companion and feed off of them for energy. In fact, most humans even desire a succubus partner. That's how Yuki ends up meeting Nono, a succubus who has thus far failed to get hired. Her job prospects were so low that she was out on the street with a cardboard sign, literally begging someone to take her home with them. When she arrives at his place, Nono says she'll work very hard and do anything he likes, except for the lewd stuff, that is. Since that's kind of the main job of a succubus, she's often been told that she's totally useless, because she gets stiff and tired whenever she tries to do something intimate. But Yuki doesn't care about all that. At the end of the day, he's just happy to have a cute demon girl staying with him, and offers her all the energy she wants. The next morning, Nono proves herself useful in a lot of other ways, waking him up with a delicious breakfast, preparing him a bento, and welcoming him home with dinner at the end of the day. She's pretty good at cooking, too. Apparently, she spent a long time honing her skills in order to make up for the fact that she's not able to do the normal succubus tasks. At the end of their first day together, Nono goes to sleep on the floor beside him, while Yuki can hardly sleep from excitement. Now he has a super cute live-in maid to cook and take care of him, who will do just about anything he asks. Hiring a succubus is already the best decision he's ever made. Three days in, and Yuki can still hardly believe his luck. Nono is super grateful to be by his side and takes great care of him. But more than anything else, he's just thrilled to have the chance to live with a cute girl who will hold his hand, cuddle with him, and even just be there to talk to him. You see, up until now, Yuki has lived a pretty lonely life. He is burdened by corrupted energy, which made all the succubae want to stay away from him. When he went to the hospital, he was told that his energy was so strong that he could put any future partners in danger. The only person who could maybe match his energy would perhaps have been the succubus queen which is obviously pretty unachievable for the average human. After that diagnosis, everyone in his neighborhood started treating him differently, calling him disgusting. Even the succubae wanted nothing to do with him. So when Nono asks him to massage her shoulders after a long day of work, he refuses, scared that if he touches her, she'll find out about his corrupted energy. She's a little upset, so he apologizes profusely and admits that he has deceived her. He's about to confess the truth, but it turns out Nono already knows, and she doesn't care. Besides, she's actually a relative of the succubus queen, so she could handle him just fine. Yuki is shocked when she grabs his hand, and is so overjoyed to be touching a girl that he starts breaking down in tears. Way to keep it cool, Yuki. Soon enough, he can't imagine living without her, and wants her around looking after him long term. She treats him like a younger brother, pampering him and cooking for him and waking him up with a bright smile every day. But this was always going to be just one week of training for Nono, after which she would finally be qualified to look after a real human and become a great employee to someone new. Even though it's only been a short time, once they hit the middle of the week, Yuki realizes he has to make the most of the days they have left together. So he gets down on his hands and knees and begs for a hug, because that doesn't look embarrassingly desperate or anything. But Nono doesn't mind. She just opens her arms and pulls him in, even enjoying it a bit herself. She says she's never had the chance to hug a human like this before, and that it's making her heart race. Little does she know, Yuki feels exactly the same way. The next day, things are a lot less lovey-dovey, when Yuki rocks up with two boys, all three of them beat up and bruised. Before she can even ask what happened, he begs her to take them in and look after them for just a little. Ever the dutiful housemaid, Nono gets to work straight away, patching them back up and even offering their guests dinner. Once the boys have had her stew, they're totally sold, and even ask if they can move in with Yuki just to stay with his succubus. Looks like there are two new members of the Nono fan club. When the boys leave, Yuki finally explains what that was all about. Those guys are actually his friends, but they got into a conversation about the succubus staying with him. Unsurprisingly, they treated the whole situation like a cheap porno, because, well, it kind of is the perfect setup. But Yuki couldn't stand them talking that way about her, so he beats them up and brought them home so they could see just how wonderful and innocent she is. Nono is touched that he would defend her honor like that, and strokes his hair, saying she's glad that he thinks about her that way. She suddenly realizes what she's doing and apologizes, but Yuki, ever the simp, is delighted and begs her to keep patting him as long as she wants. Honestly, this kid does not know the meaning of the word chill. Before he knows it, their final day arrives. Yuki can't believe she's going to leave tomorrow and spends the whole day trying to figure out a way to thank her for everything she's done. But when the evening rolls around, he is completely ambushed. Nono asks if they could spend their last night in the same bed. The poor kid is totally flustered, but Nono just wants a chance to talk side by side, and to say thank you. While she's been staying with him, she's experienced warmth and kindness for the first time in her life, so she's really very grateful. Yuki plucks up the courage to thank her too, and says he's helped her as well. For some reason, this makes Nono start crying. I guess because she's just as sad to be leaving as he is to see her go. But one way or another, she does pack her things the next morning. Yuki wishes her good luck with the job hunt, and that's that. Once she's gone, he goes into full sad boy mode 
sitting listening to the rain and lying on the floor feeling sorry for himself. Then suddenly, the doorbell goes off, and of course, he sprints to get it. And what do you know? It's Nono, back again so soon. But she seems pretty sad about something. Yuki invites her inside, but she seems determined to stand there in the rain as she admits that she lied to him too. As it turns out, she never had any intention of getting a job. She thinks of herself as a total failure, that there's no way she'll ever get employed. It's kind of a sad thing to admit, but she wanted to come back and apologize for lying to him about her true intentions, especially after he was so encouraging to her. Yuki pulls her back upright and tells her that she's wrong. Admittedly, he's also a social outcast and has no idea how succubae are supposed to act to get a job, but what he does know is that she was a joy to have around and that she worked really, really hard. So he asks her to not speak so harshly about herself, and offers her the chance to stay with him a little longer. Finally! I knew he'd work up the courage in the end. Nono gratefully accepts, and things go straight back to the way they were when she makes him dinner as a thank you. Then we get to see a bit of Nono's perspective, mainly how hard it was going for interviews and doing her best to make a good impression with potential employers. But of course, whenever they learn that she can't do lewd things, they quickly became uninterested. After all, that is kind of the point of a succubus. It must have been disheartening, but since she couldn't do what was expected of her, she worked really hard to learn just about everything else. She was just about to give up searching when she met Yuki, who made her feel accepted and useful, and accepted her just the way she is. Even in the short time they've known each other, he's made her feel like there might be a place in the world for someone like her, and gave her a reason to keep going. That's why she's so incredibly grateful to be back by his side, where she can feel useful again. But it's not just Nono who benefits from their relationship. Yuki is overjoyed that their daily routine can start up again, just the way it was last week. Although, things are slowly changing too. He can feel his succubus roommate getting more relaxed with each passing day, which is great, except it also leads to some interesting encounters around the house. Like when Nono forgot to take her clothes to the shower, and he walked into the hallway to find her in nothing but a towel. You would hope that a guy like Yuki could control himself, but remember, this guy has a sex drive so high that it's actually dangerous for him to get involved with normal humans. It's no surprise that a scene like that would drive him crazy. But it doesn't seem like Nono is trying to tease him. She looks just as embarrassed as he is. Even just remembering the incident brings him embarrassment. But Nono makes it even worse by holding him very tightly against her. She's trying to give him some kind of healing magic, but they end up slipping over because of course they do. Faced with the cute demon succubus beneath him, what do you think Yuki will do? Well, guess again. Because instead of taking advantage of the opportunity that has just been handed to him, he lunges for his cat and starts playing with it instead. Maybe he's just trying to cool off? Kind of a weird way of doing it, but whatever keeps him sane, I guess. The next day, Yuki has a test to study for, so Nono decides to support him slash torture him by dressing up as a teacher. She commends him for working so hard on his studies, and he tells her she's the reason for his motivation. Watching her work so hard to improve herself gave him the inspiration to try his best at school. Nono is really touched by that, and promises to work even harder to meet his expectations in the future. She says they should celebrate after his test, especially if he gets a good grade, and offers to do just about anything he wants. Obviously, those are the magic words for Yuki. I bet he'll ace it no problem with an offer like that on the line. But when he gets home after the test, Yuki looks incredibly exhausted. It seems like three days of cramming and studying all through the night has really taken it out of him but it's all worth it. Nono doesn't even need to wait for the results to give him his reward. She moves his head onto her lap, which makes poor Yuki just about implode as she tells him to relax. Then, she uses her succubus powers to create a kind of illusion. From their living room, she recreates one of her favorite locations, allowing a gorgeous meadow full of flowers to spring up around them. It's a special memory for Nono, and one she's been wanting to show him for a while. Since he worked so hard on the test, she tells him to let go and take a break. It's a very sweet gesture, although somehow I get the feeling Yuki won't be able to relax all that much while he's resting on her lap. They soon get the marks back from Yuki's exam, and it turns out he passed every single one of them. He didn't top the class or anything, but Nono is so proud of him that she says they should celebrate again, because apparently that wasn't enough of a reward last time. She says that as long as it's within her power, she'll literally do anything. So now comes the moment of truth. Can Yuki grab this opportunity by the horns and finally ask her on a date? The answer is no, he can't. He gets halfway through the sentence and fumbles the ball, asking her to go out to the shops with him in just about the most awkward way possible. He makes some excuse about her always being saddled with the shopping and say they only have to go for a little bit. She doesn't reply at first and Yuki thinks he might have screwed up, but actually, Nono really likes the idea. It's just that she's never gone out with a boy before, so the idea has made her all excited. And obviously, that sends Yuki over the moon. Well, that's Nono for you, and she can turn even the most awkward of proposals into an adorable adventure. When the day of the date arrives, Yuki can hardly believe his luck. 
Despite his fumbling the request, they are still technically on a date after all. He takes her out to a remote little town, and is really excited to have her by his side out in public. Even just talking to her as they walk makes him feel like his entire life has been worthwhile, which would be a bit dramatic. But it is Yuki. He never thought he'd be able to touch a girl, let alone go on a date. This is like his ultimate dream come true. He thanks Nono for coming out with him and tells her she looks especially stylish. Nono is a little flustered to see just how happy this has made him, and admits this is her first sort of date as well, so she's also really enjoying herself. Or at least she was, until the two of them are rudely interrupted by a blonde, mean-looking succubus girl who seems to recognize Nono. The stranger walks up to the two of them. She seems completely shocked that Nono could possibly have found herself a guy, and comments really that Yuki must have really weird taste to want someone like her as his partner. Obviously, Yuki isn't going to take that. As chief simp of the Nono club, he seems ready to fight this girl right there on the street. But before he can defend her, Nono cuts him off. She apologizes and goes all formal, addressing the girl as Rano-san, and remarking on how her and her partner ended up in Japan as well. And maybe it is a good thing she cut him off, because Rano's partner looks like he could take both of them with one hand tied behind his back. Rano jokes that Japanese guys are super gullible, and then goes straight back to making fun of Nono. She calls her a total newborn, mocking the fact that she still has no wings and refuses to use the power of a succubus, even going so far as to call her a brat. But Rano really steps over the line when she starts coming on to Yuki, offering him a chance to switch sides and come toy with her instead, making some really gross promises. Of course, Yuki isn't swayed at all. He calls her a very rude name and shoves her away, defending Nono and saying she's a wonderful person who doesn't need any charm, because he's already head over heels for her. Well. I guess that's one way to confess your feelings. Yuki's moment of bravery is touching, but it looks like he might have picked a fight with the wrong couple. Rano readies the giant muscle man at her side for a fight, promising to show them the true power of a succubus. The blonde beefcake by her side launches into action the moment she commands him to kill, using his huge hands to grab Yuki. But the guy ends up on his knees in seconds, quickly collapsing as soon as Yuki touches him. It seems the bond between him and his succubus isn't quite as strong as she thinks. He hardly has to use any of his corrupted energy to take him out, and leave Rano trembling on the ground as well. It's nice to see that all that corrupted energy is good for something after all. Yuki walks up to the bully and tells her never to talk about Nono like that again. As she looks up at the two of them, Rano seems to realize what just happened, and jokes that they're a match made in heaven, a useless succubus, and a monster. I guess they do make the perfect partners. But Yuki just takes it in stride, and even thanks her for the compliment, which, I have to admit, is kinda badass. Even though he got the chance to play the hero, Rano's interruption did kind of ruin their date. When the day comes to an end, Yuki apologizes for taking them to such a remote location. After all, if they had stayed closer to home, they probably wouldn't have run into that nasty succubus. He admits he was only thinking of himself, and hardly seems able to forgive himself for putting her in harm's way. But Nono doesn't see it like that at all. She tells him she was really happy on their date, and that the way he defended her was really cool. Yuki said he could see how unhappy she was by the look on her face, so Nono tells him to turn around, and asks if she still looks miserable now. When she's up this close, Yuki can hardly control himself, but for once, he doesn't have to. Nono leans in and gives him a kiss, right here in the middle of the street. How romantic! When they pull away, both their hearts are racing. But Yuki is far more affected by her charms than he was expecting. Nono has always claimed not to be able to use her succubus powers, but is that what's happening here? His body reacted before he could think twice, so maybe there is something more than romance at work. Either way, he's a little embarrassed, and doesn't want her to misunderstand his intentions. Yuki apologizes for acting so rashly, and admits he couldn't hold himself back. But Nono feels exactly the same. She also couldn't stop herself from kissing him, and now she's even more embarrassed than he is. Oh lord. They're both as bad as each other, and if this is what they're like after one kiss, who knows how they'll act when they take things up a notch. Of course, after the kiss, everything is different. Somehow they manage to make everything awkward, even just saying good morning the next day. As to whether Nono used her succubus powers on Yuki is still unclear, though we get some clues in a flashback to her childhood, sometime after Nono failed the demon awakening ceremony. At the time, she was distraught, and it probably didn't help that her mother said she didn't want a child like Nono but her great-grandmother was there to comfort her. She revealed that succubi didn't used to use their charms to capture the attention of men the way they do now. Originally, they only loved one person their whole life, and only when their love was reciprocated would they use their charm and settle down. So really, Nono was just more traditional than the other succubi. Her great-grandma apologized for not going out and setting the others straight, but little Nono didn't mind. She was just happy to have someone in her corner for once. Although it's a sweet memory, it brings tears to Nono's eyes. Partly because she misses her family, but also because it brings all her feelings for Yuki right back to the surface. Looks like these two really are head over heels for each other. I only hope they both realize it soon. The days pass, but things don't get any less awkward between Nono and Yuki. Nowadays, they're hyper-aware of every movement the other one takes. Heck, 
Even just looking at Nono makes Yuki feel like he's about to go into cardiac arrest. Luckily, his little kitty Mike is there to calm him down every time he gets flustered. Who knows why it works, but somehow playing with Mike can get him over just about anything. When Nono asks about their connection, Yuki reveals that the two of them have been together a long time. In fact, he thinks of Mike more like family than a pet. While he's having a very tender moment with his furry friend, Nono interrupts to reveal that every time he's played with his cat, he's actually been dumping all of his corrupted energy into it. As she points out, his energy is so potent that any normal person would have been dead by now. So that means Mike isn't an ordinary cat. As it turns out, Mike is a girl more like a cat-human hybrid. Yuki is absolutely shocked to discover this feline girl in place of his cat companion, and even more shocked when she starts talking, calling Yuki her master and telling him off for treating her so roughly. Well, who could have seen that coming? Yuki is still kind of in disbelief about the girl with cat ears and a tail in his living room, when Mike drops another bomb on him. It seems like they've met before, but somewhere down the road, she changed into a pet cat and stayed that way for quite some time. Though it looks like now that Nono is in the picture, Mike wants to upgrade their relationship and show off just how close she and Yuki are. She gets very touchy-feely and suggests they show the newcomer the true extent of their bond, offering to do pretty much anything he wants. Even though she's very cute, Yuki finds the willpower to pull her away and refuse, telling her she's more like family than a partner. He even asks her to turn back into a cat. He preferred when she was cute and fluffy, and not so sexual. Unsurprisingly, Mike doesn't take that very well, and has a literal hissy fit, not understanding how he could refuse her human body, while Nono sort of just watches them scuffle on the ground. Right, because that isn't awkward at all. Once she's done clawing Yuki to shreds, Mike pulls Nono aside for a chat. Yuki is pretty hesitant to leave them alone, but Mike shuts him up pretty quickly by mentioning all those other times he blew raspberries on her tummy as a cat, which... I don't know how close other people are with their pets, but that just doesn't seem right to me. Even worse, the costume she's chosen to appear in is the same cosplay from one of his favorite late night adult videos, the Shrine Maiden Kimono. Suddenly realizing just how much Mike has been witness to, Yuki buckles, so humiliated that he has no choice but to leave the girls alone. And what does Mike take this opportunity to do? Establish her dominance, obviously. She gets Nono on the floor, and once the poor succubus is pinned underneath her, Mike tells her firmly to stay away from Yuki. Nono doesn't quite catch on at first, but Mike doesn't leave a lot of room for confusion. She transforms back into her feline form, asking why Nono didn't reveal the truth about her when she's known the whole time. As it turns out, Nono has been keeping a close eye on the flow of energy between her master and his pet. You see, just as Yuki was getting rid of some of his excess energy through Mike, she was also draining him right back. Up until now, the exchange has been pretty even. But today, Nono noticed that the strength of Mike's drain was dangerous, even for someone like Yuki, so she decided to tell him the truth. Once she's turned back into her human hybrid form, Mike tells Nono she doesn't need to be worried. She doesn't have any intention of pushing Yuki past his limits. She just wants to see how much she can take without breaking him. And, she says, if anyone poses a danger to Yuki, it's Nono. Suddenly, she transforms again. But this time, Mike is no little kitty. She looks more like a Nikomata, a ferocious feline spirit. That's when she tells Nono firmly that she has no intention of allowing their little flirtation to continue. Yuki is her family, and she intends to protect him. Of course, because she's a succubus, Nono can tell that Mike isn't a real Nikomata. But for just a short while, she's able to conjure the image of one and use the same powers that a real one would have. Mike tells her story of how she was born with special powers that got her chased away from her family. That's when she found Yuki, all alone just like her, and struggling with a power just as great. As thanks for taking her in and looking after her, Mickey decided to take on all the excess energy that he couldn't contain, and they've been together ever since. After feeding off of him all these years, she's gotten more and more powerful, and he's been more relaxed. It might be a sweet story, if she wasn't using it to threaten Nono. Things get dark real fast when Mike offers her two choices. She can either be killed here and now, or leave and have her memories and feelings for Yuki devoured. Well. That's probably not the outcome Nono was hoping for when she kicked all this off by revealing the truth about their house cat. Nono finally admits that even though she doesn't know much about Yuki, she loves him very much, but she doesn't take long to decide. She asks Mike to eat her memories, not wanting to become the kind of succubus who might one day hurt Yuki. After confirming her answer, Mike opens her jaws, ready to take away every thought or feeling she's ever had of Yuki, promising to remember her once she's gone. And then, after all that drama, Mike just turns back into her cat self and says she was only kidding. Jeez, has this kitty never heard of crossing the line? 
poor Nono was literally about to give up her life. Mike seems very proud of herself for fooling Nono, and curls up into her lap, reminding her that cats are selfish creatures who love to play tricks, so I guess she shouldn't be surprised. She asks Nono for a pat on the head, but it seems like Mike has some sense of guilt. After everything she put this girl through, she's still willing to cuddle her. It was the same before, too, even though Nono was aware that the whole time of what she was doing. She still made her food and treated her like a sweet little house pet. Suddenly, she decides to repay her kindness by helping her, teaching her all about Yugi and allowing her to become a part of their family. I'm not sure why she decided to do a 180 so quickly, but so long as she's not threatening to kill her, I guess anything goes. Nono is eager to start her training right away. The next day, she asks Mike how to get closer to Yuki, knowing that no one knows him better than his former pet. Even though she likes him a whole lot, she still feels like she's not the right fit for someone like Yuki at the moment. She's very insecure about her appearance, even aside from the whole succubus and corrupted human issue. But she has decided she doesn't want to end whatever is going on between them without telling him. The only problem is she's far too shy to confess her feelings. In true Mike fashion, her first piece of advice is to find an excuse to go on the beach so that she can show off her chest. Nono seems hesitant at the idea, but her feline friend convinces her that her best assets as a succubus are her body. All they need to do is buy a swimsuit, and she even offers to come with and help her pick the right one. What an unlikely friendship these two are developing. The only hitch in their plan is Yuki. When they ask him about a trip to the beach, the first thing he says is that his sex drive is far too high to be around people in swimsuits, warning them that he'll literally explode if he has to contain himself in that kind of environment. But Mike knows just the right buttons to push to convince him. She lets slip that her and Nono already went swimsuit shopping, and mentions that they bought something really quite racy. Upon hearing that, Yuki seems even more determined to refuse the invitation, worried about combusting if he sees Nono in a tiny little bikini. And what do you know? Mike has an answer for that, too. She's able to put up a barrier, so for the moment he starts getting turned on, she can absorb his lust and keep him from overflowing, so to speak. Honestly, it all sounds pretty gross, and very convoluted, but Mike finally gets him to admit that he really does want to go. Then, Nono admits that it would be her first trip to the beach, so she wants to spend it with him, and that's the final nail in the coffin for poor Yuki. Really, these women will be the death of him someday. I can only hope Mike's barrier is strong enough. Well guys, the long-awaited day has finally come. Welcome to the swimsuit section. When they arrive at the beach, everyone seems pretty tense. Everyone except Mike, that is. She takes the opportunity to strip down to her skimpiest bikini, even bending over for Yuki and trying to entice him. Of course, it doesn't work. That kid only got eyes for Nono. Speaking of whom, when Mike notices the succubus is still wearing her jacket, she practically rips it off of her, exposing a frilly little two-piece that has Yuki lost for words. No, really. The kid literally loses the ability to speak when he sees her. Nono is pretty pleased with his reaction, which just leaves poor Mike standing in between the two of them as they giggle at each other all flirtatiously. Never thought I'd feel bad for that girl, but who'd want to be trapped between those two? After the awkward revealing of the swimsuits, the gang finally relax, enjoying the sun, sand, and sea in each other's company. Although someone is enjoying their day a lot less than the other two, and that's Mike. She's had to put up a huge barrier to keep all the other people out. The effort of maintaining that and absorbing all of Yuki's hormones would be enough for anyone, so it's no surprise that she quickly comes down with a sense of exhaustion and has the urge to puke. Honestly, I can't blame her. And it doesn't help that the longer they go on, playing games in the water and eyeing each other up, the more aroused they get, which makes it even harder to keep up the barrier. Mike can practically feel every time Yuki sneaks a peek at his succubus crush, especially at the area around her chest. So when the beach ball comes perilously close to that area, she really does have to hold back a wave of vomit. Stay strong, Mike. You're doing the Lord's work. But she can't hold out forever. So instead, Mike does the lovebirds a little favor by calling in one of Manga's favorite romantic tropes, a giant wave to knock them off their feet. Although when the water clears, it looks like it's knocked off something else as well. I'll give you three guesses what it is. When Yuki looks up and sees Nono pressed against him, very much nude from the waist up, he goes into overdrive. And you know what? I really don't blame him. He'd have to be superhuman to hold back from something like that. But now they've reached the limits of Mike's capabilities. A hole appears in her barrier, and as it begins to shatter, she burns up, reverting to her cat form and looking a little worse for wear. Yuki sprints over to her as Nono, still topless, runs along after him. They take her home, and after a long hard day of keeping her master's raging hormones at bay, Mike wants nothing more than to sleep when they get back home. Unfortunately, the young lovers and her family have other plans. Just as soon as she lies down, she is awoken by a sudden spike in the energy around their house, and a very strong wave of nausea alongside it. What's causing it, you ask? The aftermath of the wave, of course. 
Now that the two of them are alone, Nono and Yuki are going through every detail from the beach, reliving each snapshot in their minds. Nono can probably contain herself, but if we know Yuki, something like this is going to be keeping him up for hours. So Mike can forget about her hard-earned rest. Doesn't look like anyone is going to be sleeping tonight. After another sleepless night, Mike decides it's finally time to draw the line. She sits the two of them down the next morning and forbids both teens from being flirty with one another. Yuki tries to protest that they're not doing it on purpose, but then suddenly notices how fat Mike has gotten overnight. I guess he only has himself to blame for that. Mike goes off, telling him it's all his fault, that it's his disgusting sex drive that has made her this puffy from absorbing all his energy. Yuki seems more interested in playing with her pudgy little face, so Mike gives him a few scratches for good measure. She decides to take a little trip of her own, mainly as a chance to get away from the two of them and get slim again. Before she leaves, she warns them that she's put up a barrier, but they really shouldn't test it. That means no flirting whatsoever. Of course, the kids agree, but I have a feeling that isn't going to last. Now, Nono and Yuki are on their own again, and things are even more awkward than before. Nono is the first one to break the silence, apologizing for their little mishap at the beach. But Yuki says that her body was beautiful, which just sends the succubus into overdrive, struggling to process the compliment and the idea that he's seen her half naked. Then she asks him for help with something, looking at him from an interesting angle that immediately has Yuki breaking out in a cold sweat. Something tells me Mike's diet was doomed to fail from the start. No matter where she is, she's basically a walking arousal radar for Yuki. And let's be honest, when is that kid not aroused? The swimsuit date is out of the way, but we're not done with costumes yet, because now it's Halloween. Mike dresses up as a sweet little devil, while Nono, of course, is wrapped up in a mummy costume that barely covers anything. Mike leaps on top of Yuki, asking him to choose between trick or treat, while acting super flirty. But as usual, he finds a way to make it platonic by bundling her into a hug and thanking her. All that time he spent at home by himself, she knew better than anyone how badly he wanted to go to a Halloween party, and this year she brought the fun to him. Despite her trickster nature, Mike really is just one big softie underneath. Once Halloween is over, Nono announces that she's ready to look for a job again. At first, Yuki takes it as a sign that he must have upset her, but Nono explains that it's all because of his support that she can even think of getting back out there. Of course, it's very possible that she'll end up right back at his doorstep again, because she still doesn't have a whole lot of experience. So she asks Yuki to welcome her back with open arms when the time comes. Yuki agrees, and though he'll be sad to see her off, I'm sure he's proud of how far she's come by his side. Plus, poor Mike could probably do with a break from all the lust she's been absorbing. Good luck, Nono! Thank you all for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe for more.